Hello and welcome to The Hearing, I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 1980, Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables, continuing our um, punk two-parter, possibly a trilogy next week is for Garage Rock, but kind of in the same vein. Yeah. Um, Dead Kennedys are an American punk rock band that formed in San Francisco, California in 1978. Known for the controversy that they attracted due to their provocative lyrics and often that often satirized political figures and pop culture in general, and the transgriff, transgressive artwork that they often used. Um, what did they call that one that came with um, Frankenchrist, was it? Oh, oh, I forget. You know the album I'm talking about, right? Was it Frankenchrist? Oh, yeah, Christ? yeah. That, well, um, Something landscape. Well, with Frank and Christ uh, was the one with the Shriners, I think, wasn't it? Okay. What was it? Was something landscape, and it was a bunch of you know genital landscape. Um, <laughs> uh, they were uh, one of the defining hardcore bands during its initial eight year, during their initial year, year run. Um, Fresh Fruit Prodding Vegetables is the band's debut studio album. Kind of amazing to think that this was their first album. Um, <laughs> Did um, in God We Trust Incorporated. Was that? I mean, that was an EP, but I th- I always wondered if that actually predated no, this I, or according not. According to Wikipedia, this was first. Yeah. This was their first out of the gate thing, um, and it's the only album to feature drummer Bruce, Bruce Schlesinger, better known as Ted, and guitarist Carlos Cadona, better known as as a six zero two five. It was released on September second, nineteen eighty, through Cherry Red Records in the UK, and later re- reissued on Biafra's own. Um, alternative Tentacles record uh, label, Jello Biafra. I don't think I've said his first name before this. Um, in the U.S. and produced by Oliver DiCasio uh, and East Bay Ray, and features Jello Biafra on lead vocals, East Bay Ray on guitar, Klaus Fluoride on bass and backing vocals, Ted and Ted on drums, with additional musicians, uh, six oh five six oh two five on guitar on Ill in the Head. Paul Russler, keyboards on Drug Me and Stealing People's Mail. Uh, Ninochka, I didn't practice these names, uh, on keyboards on Drug Me and Backing Vocals. Dick Durkins, Dirksen, uh, Bobby Unrest, Michael Snyder, Bruce Calderwood, a.k.a. Bruce Luce, Barbara Hellbent, Hygiene, Kurt and Chi-Chi, uh, Backing Vocals. <laughs> How many of these are real names, though, of course? Um, I'm sure Barbara Hellbent and Hygiene are. Okay. Uh, a reminder, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube, on or on our blog at johnandscotto.com, you'll find links to the album on Spotify and YouTube, so you can listen along if you'd like. On to track one, Kill the Poor. <laughs> I love the slow, anthemic opening on this one. <laughs> right. Now, people compare them to the Sex Pistols no, at the not. time, at least, and um, the kind of warbly vocal. That's the and the genre. Those are the comparisons. I'd say the genre, but I think you know Although, Johnny Rotten was a one trick pony. You yeah. know he yes. and he did he did that one trick really well. Mm-hmm. But you know, Jello Jello's warble was better. Jello can be Jello goes from Roger Rabbit. To Charles Manson, yeah. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. there's there's definitely like a, a spectrum that he he can fly around on, right? And he's not menacing on this. He's singing it so sweetly mm-hmm. about killing the poor, right? <laughs> and that just makes it that much more like, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> what and are the they chorus saying? is so catchy. It yes. pops into my head at really inappropriate times. Right. <laughs> Which I mean, you know, Johnny Rotten was all about, you know, being menacing and mm-hmm. just, you know, the snarl, where Jello is about being insidious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and the lo fi recording on the album works really well for it. It sounds yeah, kind this... of crap, but it works. The mix is like different from how I remember it like mm-hmm. I feel like the music is up a lot more than it used to be in the older mixes. Okay. Like, I, I feel like the CD version I had, you know, back in the day, 
your Jello's vocals were much more over it. See, I never had it on CD. I had it on cassette, mostly listened to it in my car, so it didn't sound that much different on Spotify. And I think this was actually the first time I realized that there was, and of course, this could be a political statement, but it's the first time I realized that there was further left than liberal, you know, because yeah. you have this conservative doctrination of, indoctrination of, you know, what liberal is and mm-hmm. just this the left. Yeah. But this song is pretty much, you know, there, there's, you know, the centrists and then the left and they're talking about Jane Fonda convincing, you know, mm. yeah, it's okay if we kill everybody. <laughs> the real estate values will go up. We'll have a place. I mean, isn't it kind of what they've done with gentrification <laughs> with a, yeah. instead of the neutron bomb? Well, I mean, that's a lot of what he was talking about, too. It yes, just yes. Removal of the poor in general. Right. Get this, get this undesirable element out of the way so we can... Uh, we can make some, you know, playgrounds. Right. And just a general note about the album as a whole. Love how present the bass is. Class Fluoride was amazing. That's the other difference. The, these guys, I mean, Steve Jones and the Sex Pistols, one thing. But the rest of the band... Sid <laughs> you know, was barely on the records. Right. Right. Sid, was, Sid did not know how to play the no. bass. And whereas Klaus is brilliant, um, Ted was They try to compare the Sex Pistols to the Monkees, but that's an insult to the Monkees because they were, you know, well, pretty good musicians. Well, yeah, <laughs> except um, there was that, well, there's the commonality there is that they were both marketing gimmicks. Right, right. You know, the, the, the Pistols were a marketing gimmick put together by Malcolm McLaren and Vivian Westwood. Right. Um, and then this, of course, is a uh, manifesto more than a marketing gimmick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On to track two, Forward to Death. Love the drum sound. Love how distinct all of the instruments are. It's I have this thing, you know how people are always picky about their food touching? I'm yeah. like that with mixing. I want to hear all really? of the instruments distinctly. That's why I love sometimes, Rush. Sometimes I like it when, they, when, when they're going together, you know? Mm-hmm. No, I, mean, like I don't mean you're... playing together, but I mean just how they're mixed, where I can easily pick out the bass or the guitar or the drums. They're not. It's not a wall of sound. I'm not a big fan of the wall of sound. Oh well, so, yeah. Sometimes I really like it. Like, I mean, yeah. If it is something in unison, like mm-hmm. the keyboards and the the lead guitar playing right. a lead together, well, unison's fine. Yeah, uh, but I, I just want to hear things distinctly. The thing that struck me about this one, aside from its length, it's like the next these two songs, this one and and the next song are like a minute twenty. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of Anthrax. I think, and Anthrax's first album wasn't until like '85. This one actually would probably get my pickest for one of the weaker tracks okay. on the album. But I mean, once I, you move past the suicidal shock value, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, I think DK must have been a big influence on Anthrax. Ah, uh, probably. Because I'm hearing a lot of Anthrax on a few songs. Although um, I don't need this fucking world is a fantastic chant. Yeah. yeah. You can't um, deny that. Track three, when you get drafted, love the opening riff. This is just where they go straight up hardcore. How is this only not, not even ninety seconds? Yeah, <laughs> it's insane. And it's Jello's most growling vocal. Yes, he actually growls yeah. on this one, which caught me. I didn't. I didn't remember him growling. He's, he goes Charles Manson here, <laughs> and the sort of space sounding guitar solo. Yes. I would love to know what Ray was running it through. Uh, in the same strange way, it's like the same theme as Fortunate Son mm-hmm. by Creed's Clearwater yeah. Revival, only from the point of view of the less fortunate. Right. right. On to track four, Let's Lunch the Landlord. This is my favorite. Ah, uh, I love this one, too. Absolutely adore the bass riff. I, 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 It's the one DK thing that I've actually learned to play and play regularly. Um, <laughs> the vocal kind of reminds me of Joey Ramone. Yeah, because Joey I can R- see that. Ramone did that kind of fifties influence thing, and you know, and, and this um, is of course surf rock. Yeah, you know, surf rock, well, sixties, fifties kind of influence sort of thing that Joey was doing, and Jello kind of borrows from it here. Um, 
love the groove, love the composed guitar solo, which is not something that Ray does a lot. He just kind of lets whatever happened happen during his solos. Yeah. Except for this one, he clearly composed it. Well, the when you get drafted solo was the, yeah, the spy theme kind well, of that's thing. True, yeah. <laughs> but that was more playing with the sound effect than like a, a melody. That's true. Um, on to track five, Drug Me. This one is just super thrash. <laughs> this is he's back to roger rabbit here yeah. <laughs> it's really strange this one i mean just that that hypnotic keyboard hook to it mm-hmm. and this great kind of space guitar sound on between the vocals and on the chorus and then it gets into this whole looney tunes vibe yeah as you can hear him chasing his tail around pretty much <laughs> <laughs> and this again was another one that reminded me of anthrax um on to track six your emotions Great groove, more great um, cello warble. I checked it's probably the, the poppiest song on this one, right? Yeah. Um, I checked the years. The B-52's first album was 79, this was 80. So Fred Schneider and Jello did not influence either each other. <laughs> they both kind of had a similar thing going at the same time. And Spotify has like a rehearsal from like 78 or 79 where they're working on these songs uh-huh. that, that I'm going to listen to. Nice. Surely, I didn't want to listen to before we did the episode. Because even when we reviewed Just Fred last year, we talked about... Was it last year? Yeah. We talked Five about... Years. Hmm? Who knows about time? Well, yeah, time like is holding up. Ago, whatever. Um, time we is talk, We talked about how similar Fred Schneider and Jello are. So, oh, yeah. And this struck me on this song. And, and I was shocked this year that they really were with, within a year of each other. Um, huh. On to track seven, Chemical Warfare. Love the opening riff. Love the aggressive groove. Um, Love the complete parody in the middle. I couldn't place the song that they're referencing. (laughs) And I mean, it's funny singing about an act of terrorism like this in the early 80s. Yeah. It's almost like it's around the same time as the Talking Heads did Listening Wind, which is, of course, Mm -hmm. you know. The difference is they're just doing this for fun. Right. But that there's like a classical piece or like an old old song that they reference in the middle that is just a complete 180, which I, I oh, um, oh, I know what you're talking about, too. It's kind of like a carnival. Yeah, yeah. It's the carnival music is what it is. You're right. Yeah, um, yeah. And then just absolute chaos at the end. You're right. Track eight, California Uber Alice. Now... This this is being side two, and mm-hmm. I'd say with this album, it's it's one of the really rare exceptions where I think the second side is stronger than the first. Okay. Usually, I think you have people that they put their their you know their strongest stuff at the beginning and the mm-hmm. and here I feel, you know, they have a lot of six or two you know five stuff on the first side and right. you know they've got some good songs. But, wow. (laughs) (laughs) The lyrics for this one were written by Jello and John Greenway for their band The Healers. Jello composed the music in one of his rare attempts at composing on bass. (laughs) So it was written on a bass. Sounds like it. Love the bass line. Um, Great guitar sound. I love the sort of stabbing chords in the first verse and how the second verse really just picks up the pace. And then how it slows down to this menace in the in the bridge. Right. Have you heard the uh, the In God We Trust version? No. Uh, where it's about Reagan. No, I haven't. And Ooh. He he's straight up just yelling. Nice. On this this is kind of you know they're kind of you know tongue in cheek here. Wait, you know, this about is a joke. Nobody really Nazis. thinks that oh, you know um, Brown is going to do this. Reagan, on the other hand. <laughs> yeah, where, and of course it got covered by the disposable heroes of hypocrisy later on, mm. rapping about Pete Wilson. <laughs> and the way it picks up after it slows down to that menace, that just gradually picks up. People talk a lot about "Come On, Eileen" and how that kind of picks up in the middle. This is a yeah. much smoother way of doing it. Wow, smoother, uh, and you wouldn't expect them to be smoother. No, because "Come On, Eileen" it's a little jagged the way they pick that up. This yeah. just gradually picks up into just chaos. Yeah. 
organic poison gas. And then this great machine gun riff at the end. Now, before we get to this next story, next one, little story. Um, yeah. Back in mid nineties, um, early maybe mid early nineties, driving home from uh, college, OCC, the community college we both went to, where we met. Um, there was a Toys R Us on the way home, and I, I like toy stores. I'm an overgrown kid, so on the way home, I decide to stop into Toys R Us, listening to this album in my car. <laughs> <laughs> what song should happen to kick in the very fucking second I pull into the Toys R Us parking lot? Track nine, I kill children. <laughs> I remember just telling someone the title of this song, and it just it just blew them away that someone could go here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just think about pulling into a toy store with and you know, of course, I'm in my 20, early 20s, so I have it, you know, blasting so you can clearly yeah, hear it on yeah. the outside of the car. <laughs> and I Kill Children kicks in. It's uh, definitely the most psychotic piece of the whole album. Um. <laughs> I gotta say, this is my pick for weakest. Oh, yeah? It's just kind of boring shock value now. <laughs> I, you know, I don't think it's... I mean, it still holds its shock value. I think... No one, I mean, who's gone here since this? Oh, yeah, but it's, <laughs> it doesn't really say anything. Like, even, like, drug me and kill the poor is a lot of shock value, but it makes a point. Yeah. This doesn't make a point. He just doesn't like kids. Mm. It's just right. shock for shock's sake. I do like the nice right. little bass groove in the middle. Uh, oh, man. And then, like, everyone would die. Of course you have for it. Just like. Uh, I love how it's, I mean, it's not just that they're saying it, it's that he really breaks it down yeah, yeah. Like what he wants to do. Right. On to track 10, Stealing People's Mail. <laughs> the music is just this great riff on, like, early rock and roll and blues. This is, like, a Weird Al parody of themselves, it feels like. Yeah, yeah. Um it's hilarious, of course. Yeah, there's a great single note riff in the pre-chorus. I love the sound of the solo. And it's just this kind of like fun, straight-up rock and roll thing about literally stealing people's mail. <laughs> yes, that's what they're doing for kicks. Reminds they're me of Been Caught steal Stealing. your mail. <laughs> I think James yeah, ripped them off it of is. It. It, At least in concept. But uh, this, of course, is more personal because yes. it's not just stealing from some store. Right. It's They're going to mail. get pictures of your kids and, yeah. you know, <laughs> cut off you know, ties with your family mm. and just laugh at your letters. Mm. <laughs> On to track 11, Funland at the Beach. Love the great uh, opening riff. Um, and Jello gets very aggressive on this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in case you missed I Kill Children, they, they doubled down. Yeah, more shock value. Detail. However, it's kind of an indictment on capitalism, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Like, money over safety. Right. Just like, ah, uh, so, you know, so some kids died. But, you know, just, you know, consult your lawyer and you'll you'll get some money back. Well, and that that's kind of my point with I Kill Children. Because Jello does go dark. But Jello yeah. usually goes dark for a point. You that know? was kicks. <laughs> it, it, but I Kill Children was just dark for dark's sake. At least in this yeah. one even. You know, he goes dark. He goes shock value, but it makes a point. Yeah. Um, nice short solo. Ray doesn't solo him often, but I like how he, when he does, he, he makes it worth it. Um, track 12, Ill in the Head. Great chaotic opening. Love the kind of off-kilter riff between the vocals. Um, it's pretty much the same song as Forward to death except in a lot of ways yeah i like this one better because i mean he doesn't have the the i don't need this fucking world but i just think it comes together as a song better yeah um i love how it slows and gets even weirder in the chorus the end gets kind of proggy oh yeah which is not something i thought i'd ever say about dk (laughs) Well, I mean, for them, this is uh, quite a long song at 2 minutes and 46 True. seconds. Not the longest, though. Um, I think that's no, California no. Burrell. 
Um, on to track 13, Holiday nah, in Cambodia. This is the longest. This is the longest? This is four and a half minutes. Okay, it was this one. I don't know if it was this one or California or else. Okay. Um, the use of the N-word doesn't age well. <laughs> uh, that came up when um, I think it was uh, Serge uh, Thank you. and Dave Grohl uh-huh. uh, covered this. Okay. Uh, and he just he changed it to how the brothers feel cold. Okay. But, of course, the point of the song is that it's some asshole who's bragging, right. you know, <laughs> he would use that word right. while he's bragging about how that's the point of the lyric. Right. Is that he's using that word while he's bragging about how he knows their experience. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the, the character in the song. Yeah. Um, well, over the kind of avant garde the guitar at the beginning. He's just, oh, yeah. Ray is just making noise, but he's doing it in a really interesting way. Ray, this whole song is just this crazy atmospheric thing of tension, mm. you know. And and Ray's guitar work is fascinating because it's simple, but it's incredibly well thought out. Right. Oh yeah, especially in this song. This this, this is a masterpiece in a way for you know, and it has to get my pick for strongest mm. uh, track just because of it. It's just it it it's so much tension and so much. <laughs> with, with the political statement too of course yeah but also being like these assholes should just be sent to uh-huh. cambodia and who was it i thought ray was like I, I had a theory back in the day that ray turned into was it uh, i had a theory i had a theory that ray was was alger okay it was your theory okay <laughs> um because they wound up you know working together on lard mm-hmm. But uh, you know, Ray is a different person apparently. Yeah. Um, but his his playing is, is just fascinating because it's simple but incredibly well thought out. Um, he could be a better guitar player than Al. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he is. For all I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Al's not a great guitar player. Um, on to track fourteen, the closer, "Viva Las Vegas." Yes, it is an Elvis cover. Um, Elvis kind of so... works better as punk. You had the uh, the climax and holiday in Cambodia, mm-hmm. and you get the Day in uh, Viva Las Vegas. Yeah. I love how loud the bass is. Elvis kind of works better as punk. That's really all I have to say about it. Uh, you know, it's it's they just turn something innocent into something sub- subversive, which is what they're all about. Yeah. yeah, there's a little bit of a change in the lyrics. There's something about coke at the end. <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, there is Vegas of just being this debauchery and just, well, what else is going on there? You well, know? it's Elvis. Yeah, it's yeah, true. So they had to reference him. Um, stupid question, but do you recommend it? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, as far as punk albums go, I think this is the... the I've always used this one as kind of like the, the blueprint, the proto... For hardcore, yeah, in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, I recommend it too. It's just a classic of early hardcore. If you haven't heard it and you like the genre, you just owe it to yourself to check it out. Like if someone came to me and said, "Hey, you know, I've never heard a punk album before. Which one? Which what album should I hear to to like really get the genre down?" And yeah, I would give them this one. Mm-hmm. All right, that's it for Fresh Fruit for Rotting Vegetables. Until next time, it'll be reviewing Swears by Marion Call. Yes, we've done a Marion Call album before, but this is one is a big departure. It's also an EP, which is something we we said we wouldn't do, but again, big departure, so I think it bears talking about. Plus, we're doing hey, an minute. anime to double feature on Zombie Takeout next week, so it'll be nice to have a very short episode of the have hearing. Have you heard this music already, or no? I've heard one song from it. Okay, so it, I, it would be really funny if she's hyping this as a big departure, and it wasn't. <laughs> I've heard one song called Fix It. Um, her version of Garage Rock is interesting, because okay. she's very inter- very influenced by kind of musical theater and traditional pop and even yeah. classical. And most of her stuff is kind of jazz-influenced folk. Yeah. So to hear her do Garage Rock, it's kind of fascinating. I don't know if it exactly works, but <laughs> the lyrics are genius. Um, well, I mean, sometimes I find that exciting when you're going on a uh, yeah, yeah. a journey, you know? Right. All right. And anyway, until then, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, 
There you are. There you are. Thank <music> you.